Thank you, everybody, for coming to this afternoon talk. I'm very impressed by the attendance. I did not expect so many people to come here, little old me, but thank you so much. Now, with my talks, I want to invite you guys, and I did seriously mean this, feel free to interrupt me as I'm speaking, and if you have questions as I go, just raise your hand and yell at me, or just yell. I'm totally okay with that. I do not mind it at all. You will not offend me, I promise. Um, so I've been teaching chemistry in one form or another for the past 14 years at a university level. Over those years, my research emphasis has gradually shifted in the world of organic chemistry from specializing in trying to invent or develop new ways of making small molecules with medicinal properties to chemistry education. The reason I've kind of shifted in that direction is because I tried to dovetail my role statement of being a teaching emphasis professor a little bit more. And it's worked out, I think, reasonably OK. But with all that said, I've published a number of chem education papers over the years where I have lots of data and lots of anecdotes and different things. And f for this talk, I'm not going to share any of that. Instead, what I'm going to share is four basic principles that I've distilled down that basically encapsulate my personal philosophies regarding teaching, why I teach the way I teach, and how I do that. Now, with that said, please do not misunderstand when I teach these four principles. Don't think, I guess what I'm saying, that these are all encompassing, that you have to do these four principles or you're a terrible teacher. That is not what I'm saying. Nor am I saying that I'm the best teacher, nor, that I'm, nor am I saying, I'm not saying that I'm even perfect at living my own principles. I'm just trying to say that these are like the four principles that essentially encapsulate what I do and why. And I'm hoping that in sharing them with you today, I may be able to in maybe strengthen or give you guys some ideas of different ways that you can improve your own teaching. Because for me, that's kind of what the ETE conference is all about, helping us develop as teachers. And uh, I'm also plenty uh, open to receiving feedback from you guys, too, regarding anything that I can do to improve. In any event, I don't want anyone to think that I'm trying to pretend that I embody teaching perfection and I'm you know, trying to lecture down to you, you know, support. That's not what this is at all. This is just me sharing sort of my philosophies and ideas. I'm not going to share a lot of data. Most of this is anecdotal, but it has played a key role in sort of the way that I've developed uh, my teaching philosophy and methods. So being at USU for the past seven years, I started in fall of 2011. I was introduced to a book uh, written by, well, let's see, I'll go back, yeah. So I written by um, Clay Christensen and Henry J. Eyring. Clay Christensen is from the Harvard Business School, dean or former dean of the Harvard Business School, and Henry J. Eyring is the president, I believe current president, unless this has changed, of BYU-Idaho. So they wrote this book called Innovative, The Innovative University. Some of you might have heard of this. I had never heard of this until I became a faculty member here at USU, and then we had one of these teaching seminar things for new faculty where they showed us this book. One of the interesting things about this book is it talks about this business theory called disruptive innovation. This business theory was actually pioneered by Clayton Christensen. The theory basically is like this. In the world of business, and I'm a chemist, of course, so this is kind of outside of my wheelhouse. I'm trying my best to summarize this as I understand it. In the world of business, there are occasions in which you have large companies that develop very expensive specialized products that only cater to very wealthy niche clients. For example, you can imagine going back to the 1960s, 1950s, at times when computers used to take up entire rooms. You guys remember that or have seen, heard about it in history books? Anyway, they used to be that way. And back then, the only entities that could afford a computer were huge companies or universities or government agencies because they were really expensive. And as a result, those types of companies would kind of ignore little companies like IBM or Apple that are developing these really cheap things called the personal computer. Because the personal computer didn't have any of the abilities of their room-sized computers, and they were kind of expensive and for this sort of niche group, so they got ignored. What happens when they get ignored? Well, for years, they essentially aren't being crushed by competition. And gradually, you have the personal computer eventually disrupt the entire field and take the place of room-sized computers. That's called a disruptive innovation. Does that kind of make sense conceptually? Where like the big dogs are ignoring the, these little guys because they don't think the little guys pose a threat. And then the little guys eventually make their product that initially is not really high quality and it's for a really niche market. They make it better and better and better until eventually they completely supplant bi the big guys. And this essentially is what happened with room-sized computers. Do we have any of those anymore? Not really. <laughs> well, you know, unless you go to Google and they got rooms full of servers and stuff, but, but not the way they used to be. 
Thankfully, we have stuff that's way better. So the point is, one of the key aspects of this book is they point out that in the world of universities or higher education, higher education universities since they began hundreds of years ago have essentially been uh, insulated from any disruptive innovation. Why? Uh, the reason is because traditionally there hasn't been another way to receive a higher education other than stand in a room with a teacher. You know what I mean? For the larger majority of the lifetime of universities, for hundreds of years. Now, what they're suggesting, and they suggest as the main thesis of their book, is that because of the internet, now there exists technology that has the potential and is gradually disrupting higher education. Does that make sense? There are online colleges and online universities that, kind of like the Apple computer when it started, may not and probably don't offer as high a quality of education as you'd get at a traditional brick and mortar institution, but they gradually develop and develop and develop and get better and better and better and less expensive and more nimble and competitive until the potential exists, at least. I'm not predicting the future, but they're proposing, as their hypothesis, that the potential exists for those to eventually unseat or disrupt higher education. And indeed, we are seeing that happen to one degree or another. Does that kind of make sense, how it applies to us? So as a consequence, some educators are nervous. So there was this, um, <laughs> there was this sort of uh, big survey done. And well, I've, I've taken excerpts and quotes from different surveys and news stories quoting prof uh, tenured professors at different institutions talking about their concerns regarding the future of higher education. So for anyone in the world of higher education, which is probably, hopefully, all of us in one way or another, I'm just going to read these quotes, because they're fun. So the first one says, this is uh, from uh, Dr. Wheeler, and I did not write down uh, which institution Dr. Wheeler is from. Nevertheless, Dr. Wheeler says, if higher education continues down its current path, full-time professors, already an endangered species, may become extinct. The reason? Uncontrollable fervor for online education. Now, again, I'm not saying that this is going to come true. I'm just saying that Dr. Wheeler is worried about this. Another quote, and this, is, th this, by the way, is from a very, very large study uh, done by the Pew Research Center. So I sort of cherry-picked some excerpts that showcase some of the concerns that higher educators and faculty members are having. So this is a long quote, but I'll read it again because I think it's pretty cool and it encapsulates this uh, sentiment. It says, quote, higher education will not even, this is a prediction that this professor is making for the future. Higher education will not even need all the buildings they're constructing because it will all be Walmart University. The best professors, based on someone's criteria, I cannot specify, will be identified, recorded, uh, perhaps have some enhancements, and then cataloged, and everyone can take those courses for their degree. I fear that everyone will get the same degree as this replaces high school, and perhaps the advanced education will eliminate courses such as liberal arts and focus on the technical aspect of a few select majors. I think most courses will be online with video audio, and maybe writing will be minimal. It is possible that 2020 brings, to the, more, uh, brings the move to hybrid, and that my scenario occurs, say, by 2040. So um, again, I'm not necessarily saying that this scenario is going to occur. I'm just saying this is one thing that one higher educator is concerned about. Does that only, can you guys kind of follow what I'm talking about, the, the real life concerns that higher educators are having? Not all these concerns are necessarily going to happen. We don't have a crystal ball to be able to predict what's going to happen. But you can at least understand that I think that there is some valid justification behind the concerns. What is my point in sharing this? Well, for those of us who are in careers in higher education, which I think is all of us to one extent or another, we should care about this. Right? Especially those of us who maybe want to have a long career, we don't want to get fired or, or become irrelevant. Does that make sense? Uh, one quote that I like, Henry uh, Eyring, not to be confused with Henry J. Eyring, this is Henry Eyring is Henry J. Eyring's grandpa. Henry Eyring, I like him a lot because he was a chemist. And he happened to be a chemist uh, previously at uh, Princeton, I believe, and then moved to the University of Utah. There's a, an anecdote that goes like this, and I took this from the American Chemical Society webpage. When talking with a coworker one time, and this was during a time uh, where there was some pretty intense economic hardship, not during the Great Depression, I don't believe, but sometime thereabouts, Eyring said to a coworker that he worked harder than required because, quote, if the economy goes to ruin and there's only one chemist in the country with a job, it's going to be me. <laughs> now, I, I realize that I don't know if he was totally serious when he said that, and this is a little bit of a personal anecdote from one individual saying this. Nevertheless, the point is, I hope that all of us will do our best to understand that because of the internet and the potential for innovative disruption in the world of higher education, our jobs may likely change. 
And in order for us to make sure that we are the one people with a job left in the country, if there is any one left job in the country, and there will be, I, again, I don't want to, I'm not trying to say gloom and doom, but I, I want us to all stay employed. Does that make sense? <laughs> okay, so I just want all of us to do our best to develop and become the best educators that we can. Does that make sense? And for that reason, I've had this boiling in my mind for years when I wrote up a book chapter on the subject. And the subject, of course, is uh, back to basics, four principles of uh, higher education that I believe will never go expired. And this is what I'm saying. From my years of teaching chemistry, I have four basic principles that I've developed that I believe will never expire no matter what happens in the future regarding teaching. And some of them might seem very, very basic. But sometimes the basic fundamentals are also things that you can't do away with. They're essential. Does that make sense? So I'm going to share them with you again. You can disagree with them or agree with them or whatever you want. One thing that we do understand, of course, is the fact that all of us have probably seen good teaching, but unlike physical things that you can measure on a scale, for example, I can measure the mass of something on a scale, good teaching is a lot harder to quantify. I think it is. I mean, I can see good teaching and say, that person is a stellar teacher, but it's a lot I can't put it on a scale. I can't shoot light at it and have it refract. And It's a lot harder to quantify good teaching sometimes, I think, than actual physical things that you can physically measure on a scale or using a spectrometer or something. Nevertheless, we know that it exists. Um, so with that said, I'm just trying to suggest that there are many different styles of teaching and teachers that are phenomenal in many different fields. So again, I'm not trying to suggest that all my four principles are all encompassing or that they all need to be cookie cutter fit in the exact same way to every single individual in any discipline. I just want to suggest to you guys that I personally have found them to be very, very important. And I think that they will become indispensable as technology continues to shift and change the field of higher education in the coming years. So with that said, here is my first principle. You guys ready? <laughs> okay. First principle is avoid baffling jargon. Now we uh, professors, by the way, in, that's it. <laughs> <clears throat> we professors in the physical sciences in particular, and I don't mean an insult to physical science professors, I am one of them, we are probably the most guilty of this. And with that said, I understand that um, in our fields, all of our fields are filled with jargon, filled with vernacular that you cannot avoid in order to do good teaching. However, so I'm not saying that we don't teach the language of our fields just because it's hard or baffling. I am suggesting that we should avoid using unnecessarily baffling jargon. Does that distinction make sense? I hope so. A couple of principles that I outline with this are the idea of, for example, well, gosh, the, I'm going to just tell you a personal story. There was a time once when I was in graduate school and I was assigned to be a TA for a visiting professor. This visiting professor was brilliant, and you could tell that he was brilliant. However, he could not give you directions to 7-Eleven that you could understand if you asked him. Couldn't. Every single question that a student asked, no matter how simple the answer, always had the terms eigenvalue, vector, or Schrodinger's equation in the answer, or, or a combination of all three. Questions like, how long is the test? Well, if we look up Schrodinger's equation, he starts writing stuff on the board, like, just say 50 minutes, that's the answer, you're done. And see, this is what I'm saying. When, when a student asks a question, I don't know if any of you guys have seen politicians answer questions. You ask a politician a question. If the answer is a target on a bullseye, the politician goes, until everyone's bored and they forgot what the question even was. And while he's doing this, he steals your wallet. You know what I'm talking about? So same thing can kind of happen with professors. And th this happened to be the case with this particular professor. And I could see... There was one occasion that was so terrible when he answered a question and no one, and it was a simple question. The answer was like orange or something, or yes. I, and he talked for 10 minutes and no, I could, I could see, I was looking around at the students in the classroom and they just all looked like they want to strangle the guy. So anyway, I'm begging you guys, if the answer is yes, say yes. If the answer is no, say no. If the answer, answer is pi halves, say pi halves. But don't go and try and... Our objective as professors is not to try and dazzle our students with how brilliant we are by using really expensive sounding words. Our objective as professors is to do the best job of teaching that we can. And sometimes we make the mistake of thinking that if I use more words, I'm doing a better job of teaching. No. Usually it's the opposite. Use fewer words, but make sure that the words you pick 
are good and efficient. Does that make sense? So use fewer, better words, not more words. And usually you're doing a better job of teaching. With that said, years ago I attended an NSF uh, workshop in Salt Lake hosted by this guy, Chris Mooney. This is an interesting workshop, by the way. Chris Mooney, his career has been spent in uh, media and show business. And he's teaching a room full of scientists, all higher educators, all professors, about the art of communicating. So this National Science uh, Foundation workshop was titled, um, entitled, oh, heavens, I'm forgetting the name here. It was entitled Science Becoming the Mes Messenger. They've been ho holding it since, I believe, 2012. And they're holding it every single year. And the purpose of this, uh, of this workshop they're constantly holding every year is to teach higher educators, specifically in the physical sciences, how to talk more clearly to people outside of our fields. That's it. Now, with that said, one of the things that he shared was this video I'm going to show you that's really funny. Uh, sorry, I'll go back one slide. Um, this video is called the Turbo Encabulator. I'd never seen this before. Some of you hopefully have not seen it before. It's really funny. It was done by a, a narrator named Bud Haggart, who was apparently a narrator for a lot of commercials, like car commercials back in the 70s and 80s. Anyway, Turbo Encabulator is actually based on an engineering paper that's completely satirical, written by someone named Dr. Jack... Um, actually, I lost the name. It's written by a person who is an engineer, and it's completely satirical. But the whole purpose of the paper is to make fun of how scientists and engineers often use baffling jargon unnecessarily. So the entire video you're about to see is satire. Does that make sense? But why in the world is Chris Mooney sharing this video with us? Because he's trying to tell us as scientists something. What do you think he's trying to say? Yeah, stop sounding like this guy. <laughs> anyway, with that said, here's the turbo encabulator. Please keep in mind, you're welcome to laugh, because I think it's hilarious, but it's supposed to be. So. For a number of years now, work has been proceeding in order to bring perfection to the crudely conceived idea of a transmission that would not only supply inverse reactive current for use in unilateral phase detractors, but would also be capable of automatically synchronizing cardinal grammeters. Such an instrument is the turbo encabulator. Now, basically, the only new principle involved is that instead of power being generated by the relative motion of conductors and fluxes, it is produced by the modial interaction of magneto-reluctance and capacitive directance. The original machine had a base plate of prefamulated amulite surmounted by a malleable logarithmic casing in such a way that the two spurving bearings were in a direct line with a panometric fam. The latter consisted simply of six hydrocoptic marzal veins so fitted to the ambifacient lunar wane shaft that side fumbling was effectively prevented. The main winding was of the normal lotus o delta type placed in panendermic semi-boloid slots of the stator, every seventh conductor being connected by a non-reversible tremie pipe to the differential girdle spring on the up end of the grammys. The turbo encabulator has now reached a high level of development and it's being successfully used in the operation of nofertrunions. Moreover, whenever a fluorescent score motion is required, it may also be employed in conjunction with a drawn reciprocation dingle arm to reduce sinusoidal replenition. It's not cheap, but I'm sure the government will buy it. All right. I love that video. I laugh every time. I love the Turbo encabulator. Turbo encabulator, spelled exactly as it sounds. <laughs> Sinusoidal repleneration, a dingle arm. I mean, you're watching that, and it's like, of course, of course, a dingle arm. Yeah, I... And so hopefully, hopefully, my point here is clear. Please avoid um, baffling jargon. The purpose, this is the stated purpose on their website for this workshop from the National Science Foundation. It is to develop or to help professors develop writing and new media skills to hone their public presentations and even to produce video. I could expound on that, but if I did, I would run out of time. So these are basically my um, bullet points on this. One of the ideas that I've, I've already said all these things, but number four is practice teaching your hardest concept. This is my own personal idea on this. In order to help improve the way that we teach, especially when we're dealing with our most difficult concepts, is I, I strongly invite you guys to film yourselves. Sit in your office. I know that you're Colleagues down the hall will think you're crazy talking to yourself. You can warn them in advance as to what you're doing. Film yourself, watch yourself, and then, and then look and ask yourself, are there any words that I could replace with 
words that have fewer syllables that mean the exact same thing? Are there phrases I could get rid of? I know that sounds maybe a little bit crazy, but if you do that it'll, and do it with multiple iterations, you'll get better and better and better to be able to simplify complex teachings. I've heard an old saying that true genius is the ability to take something complex and teach it in such a way that a child understands it. Now, I realize that that isn't always possible, but that is sort of the gold standard to which I try to apply myself. All right. Now to principle two. Principle two is do not be afraid of change. Be willing to learn new things. How are we doing on time, by the way, Kim? Well, you have about three minutes. For this. You have 13 minutes left. Awesome. OK, so you a 10 Matt Sanders, I believe, he's one of our faculty. I believe he's in the College of Engineering. Does anyone, can anyone confirm that? Communication. Communication. See, I don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> Sorry. So Matt Sanders. So I don't know what department he's, he's from, but I have called and talked with him on the phone. He wrote this book called Becoming a Learner. It's a, it's a small book. You can read it in one sitting, but it's a great book. And one of the quotes I love from it is this. He says, the primary purpose of college isn't learning a specific set of professional skills. The primary purpose of college is to become a learner. A lot of people don't understand this. They think that the purpose of college is to learn technical training uh, that will take you straight to employment. Now, while that is a secondary purpose of college, I think, and I believe this, that one of the most, that, that the most important purpose of a higher education at a university level. See, if you want to just learn a trade, those, that's for technical schools, and that's exactly what they do. But I think the most important thing that I gain from my university education is learning how to learn. Does that make sense? Here's a fact. Every single field into which we go professionally is going to require change down the line. Things are going to change. There's going to be change. And one way that we can ensure that we are prepared for whatever changes come is to increase our ability to learn new things. How do you do that? By keeping your brain nimble. That's why I strongly invite you, I'm sure you guys do, but continue to do so. Learn new things. Keep your brain nimble so that if some big magnanimous change happens in your career that requires you to completely learn a new skill, your ability to jump from that to another is a lot easier. Developing brain power cognitively and keeping your brain fine-tuned is a lot like exercising a muscle. It's a lot easier to jump from one sport to another professionally if you've kept yourself athletically honed than it would be if you'd just been sitting on the couch all the time. Does that make sense? Same thing with your brain. And this is why I strongly invite you to do not to not fear change and be willing to learn new things. As an example, um, I flipped my classrooms. You guys have heard a lot about this. When I came to USU, um, I had no idea how to make a video. I'd never made one before. Now I have a YouTube channel that has a pretty okay-ish following and a lot of views, but I don't really care about that. What I care about is that I use it as a tool to teach my students. How in the world did I go from knowing nothing about making videos to making videos? I learned. <laughs> See what I'm saying? So uh, sometimes it's very tempting as professors and educators and staff members and so forth to become ossified and stuck in doing things the way that we do them. And I will not change. And someone brings something, a new idea, like maybe you could tweak this a little bit. No! I've been teaching from the same weathered pages for 15 years and I will not change it now. Don't do that, please. I want you guys, I want me, I want all of us to stay employed forever until we retire. I'm, not, I'm planning on retiring while lecturing at the podium and dying. That will be my retirement part. I'll be 170 year olds teaching about chemistry and I'm just, that's my goal. Nevertheless, if we keep ourselves adaptable and willing to learn new things, then when shifts happen magnanimously in or, or you know, seismic shifts happen in our career fields, we can more easily adapt and jump over them because we've learned how to learn. How many minutes do I have, Kim? Oh, I have exactly 10 left? Wow, I spoke really quickly. Okay, principle number three is love your students, love your job, and act accordingly. Um, <clears throat> I personally believe that probably every one of you folks in higher education, and I assume, all of you, I assume probably most of you guys are, I, I, I don't really, some of you guys might have just come off the street, I don't know. But I assume you guys love teaching, and I hope you do. If you don't love teaching, uh, you can certainly develop that love, but if you really hate it, you're probably in the wrong field if you're in higher education, right? Nevertheless, one of the things that happens to even people who love teaching is we sometimes have bad days. We all have bad days. And sometimes it's tempting to let that frustration out. Um, I hope that we will not do that. Um, as a couple of prin principles connected to this, I want you guys... Um, well, I'm just going to say a, a few suggestions that I wrote down. <laughs> 
Yeah. I, I had an old professor, by the way, when I was in grad school who said this. He, 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 I love this guy. He said, students are what we do. When I, when, I, when, he, when I was asked him, you know, what do you professors do? He says, students. And what did he say? He didn't say conference presentations. He didn't say research grants. He didn't say research. He didn't say committee work. He said students. In other words, for him, his central priority of all that he did in his career was the success of his students. And I personally know from that particular example that he believed that because he acted that way. So these are a couple of suggestions. And these are things that I do. And you guys are welcome to do them or not. But I do them. I actually take the time to thank my students for being my students every semester, a couple times per semester in every class. I point out the fact that I couldn't do my job, which I love so deeply, if they weren't there sitting in those chairs. So I thank them. Another idea is ensure your students that the grade that they earn in your course is not a reflection of how you feel about them personally. You can have students that you detest who earn A's. You can have students that you really like personally flunk your class. But please make sure they understand your grade is not my feelings for you. You earn your grade. Professors don't give grades. Students earn grades. Next is never be offended by questions. For some reason, some professors, well, I, I have a personal anecdote on that, but I don't have any time about a professor who was so upset when a student answered a or asked a question. Never be afraid to say, I don't know the answer to that question, or I have never thought about that. There are some professors, I don't know why, and I'm assuming it's probably no one in this room, but I, ha I do know some professors personally where a student will ask a question, and the professor obviously doesn't know the answer to the question. <laughs> but the professor, instead of saying, I don't know the answer to that, will like, answer like a politician, do -do 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 until the student gets so confused that the student just like, OK, I can't even remember what I was asking. We don't have to do that. For some reason, some professors are scared that the students will mutiny if a professor says, I don't know the answer to that question. I am never afraid of that. If a student asks me a question I don't know the answer to, I genuinely say, I have never thought of that, or I don't know the answer to that question. That is a great question. What does that do to the student? It tells the student that you as a professor are still learning, right? We professors, even though we have PhDs, I'm Dr. Mike Christian, we are not immutably, we are not perfect. We don't know everything. We're still lifelong learners, right? Tell my student, I'm still learning. But every time one of my students asks or, set, or asks me a question to which I do not know the answer, I always pledge to answer the question later. And um, then I do. I look it up, and I learn and develop and grow. Also, when students ask questions, if you don't have time to answer the question, respectfully say, thank you for the question. I'm sorry we don't have time to answer it right now, but I swear to you, email me the question, and I'll answer it out of, outside of class. And I do that all the time, too. And um, I, I'm gonna, I'll just read these really quickly because I have how many minutes? Five, OK. Grade your students' work and give them prompt feedback. Show enthusiasm. Speak with <laughs> passion, fervor, and excitement. Avoid making your lectures dreary, monotone, inflectionless sermons. Never express a dislike of your job in front of students or colleagues. Now, this might sound weird, but I understand it's, it's sometimes it's, we have challenging days. We love our jobs, but sometimes we have challenging days. And the temptation exists to be down the hallway and, mo and, and sort of express my frustration to a colleague. Man, I hate this. I hate this class. I hate this. Don't do that. And one, the reason that I'm saying that is because your colleagues are going through stuff too. And you don't want to burden them with your burdens. Take it to someone else. <laughs> okay. Reply swiftly to students' emails or texts and suppress the tendency to stereotype students and instead focus on their tremendous potential. One quote that I love on this subject comes from the old philosopher Johann Vol Wolfgang von Goethe who said, if I accept you as you are, I will make you worse. But if I treat you as though you are what you're capable of becoming, then I will help you become that. I love that quote because it kind of emphasizes the idea that our students have potential. And sometimes they might not look like what they can become. So try in your mind's eye when you see a student not to see what they are, but see what they can become, the potential that they can become. And treat them like that. And they'll have a greater prevalency for becoming that. And the last principle, which I have no time to really discuss, is get to know your students and modify your lessons to connect your course to their interests and academic goals. In my years of flip teaching, which I've been doing for the past five years, I guess since 2012, um, one of the great benefits that I didn't imagine would happen with flipping is it frees up in class time to where I get to know my students very well. I know their jobs. I know their spouses' names, their kids' names. I know things they're going through outside of class that are sometimes challenging because I don't have in class, I don't have to get through lecture because all the lectures pushed outside on videos, so we spent in class time 
I'm doing problem sets and work together, and I can ask them questions. And I keep an actual computer at my lectern where I, I try not to be stalkery or creepy about it, but I do ask them questions like, so tell me something fun about yourself. Not overly personal. I don't want to get sued, but tell me something just interesting about yourself. Hobby, favorite food, I don't know, something fun. And I actually type it down. And then what I try to do is later in the semester, if that particular student asks me a question, I try to connect that concept about which they've asked with their hobby. Which sounds weird. I call these things bridging questions, and that's a paper on the subject. It sounds weird, but I've made tons of connections between in-class concepts and personal habits or uh, preferences or things about students. For example, I wrote some of them down. I once related a chemistry of fossil fuel combustion to military vehicles for a student who happened to be an army auto mechanic. I once connected water purification chemistry to a recent lead contamination thing that you guys heard about going on in, in Michigan, Flint, Michigan, to a student that I had in Brigham City who had moved from Michigan. I once uh, discussed the chemistry of pesticides and fertilizers with a student who lived on a farm. And I once addressed a long series of questions about the chemistry of cosmetics to a student who had recently worked in cosmetics industry. One thing that was hilarious is I once had a student ask me about molecular orbitals. And I knew that she had played previously on a college basketball team. So I tried my best to make the connection. And it was horrible and failed terribly. But it was hilarious. And sometimes hilarious has value. And it's sometimes students appreciate I'm connecting something that I know about you. I know about you. And I don't just do that with the students in the room, but I teach to sites all over the state. So I'll be like, so-and-so over there in Moab. So you asked this question about molecular orbitals. Let me I know that you played point guard on your uh, JV team. Let me see if I can connect the two. And then I make a terrible connection. But again, she appreciates that I know her. Does that make sense? So that's the end of my presentation. Thank you guys for coming. <laughs>